the Russians were not proposing to embrace Ukraine as part of their sphere of influence, they were precisely asking for its neutralization. And um, the fact that this was rejected uh, was the product of a combination of triumphalism, um, you know, uh, knee-jerk Russophobia, um, and um, a desire to uh, put Russia down. Let's move to European affairs, because you were the man, I believe, who coined the sentence that uh, US, the US and NATO would be willing to fight to the last Ukrainian in the ongoing war. Do you think that that is still true? And will the US ever be willing to uh, go back to a more diplomatic approach in order to find a settlement of this obviously World War I style trench warfare that we have by now? I'm afraid that uh, we have been very cynical. If you read uh, uh, the pundits' commentary in the American press, they will say that, well, this was a windfall for the United States because without losing any American lives, uh, we managed to weaken and isolate Russia. Frankly, I don't believe we did manage to weaken and isolate Russia, but that is the established narrative. Um, is there any evidence that people care about Ukraine and Ukrainians in all this? Not much. Uh, we now hear stories that say that the faltering of the Ukrainian offensive against the Russians uh, was anticipated, that uh, people in Washington and in Mons, um, in Belgium, uh, hoped that you can't, Ukrainian bravery would compensate for the lack of weaponry and the lack of numbers on the part of the Ukrainian military. I think this is exceedingly cynical. Um, I have great respect for the bravery of both parties to this combat. Ukrainians and Russians are cousins. They are re related peoples. And they have both shown that they are amazingly tough and brave on the battlefield. But numbers count, as does size and technology. And uh, I think the Russians um, are prevailing. What will happen, we do not know. But I know that uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, the uh, recently reappointed Secretary General of NATO, now says that there is no path for NATO to accept Ukraine as a member and accept a Ukrainian victory. And I think almost no one now expects a Ukrainian victory. President Biden has said that Ukraine can become part of NATO when there is a peace treaty with Russia. That is, Never. arguably... Um, some sort of anticipation of a diplomatic negotiation to end this. Of course, there was a diplomatic negotiation um, back in 2022, which Boris uh, Johnson apparently um, spoiled. Um, and um, what I think uh, is, is, is likely to happen now, because I believe the Russians are in the beginnings of their own offensive against Ukraine, is that uh, we will see the Russians take uh, territory and menace Odessa, which if they took Odessa, the, the Ukraine would no longer have a sea coast. Um, I think uh, they will offer peace in return for withdrawal from those areas that they don't care about in Ukraine, uh, and in return for not taking Odessa. And if Ukraine balks, they will take Odessa. Uh, they will have the capability to do that. Uh, the very odd, the strangest thing about what is happening is at the very moment when people in NATO, like the German defense minister, are admitting that NATO does not have the capacity to fight Russia, uh, even though Russia has not had the capacity to overwhelm Ukraine, um, 
NATO is talking about doing things in East Asia. Well, if you can't defend your own space, your own European homeland, what are you doing talking about doing things in, in Asia? Uh, this is very strange, and it appears to be posturing uh, for the benefit of, of people in Washington rather than a serious initiative. I don't see what European armed forces could do that would be of least use in the contingencies that East Asia faces, whether there are a renewed war in Korea, uh, or they are a Taiwan war, uh, or they are naval combat in the South China Sea. You know, when um, for the last one year, a question that haunted me very much is why did neutrality not become the off-ramp and the solution to Ukraine? Because to anyone, I believe, with, with any kind of historical knowledge, the Ukrainian case is so similar to the Austrian case in 55 exactly. that it should have been the solution. Kishinzer said it, uh, Chomsky said it, I think you said it. Like There's so many people who said it, and we know that in uh, in end of March uh, last year, this neutrality agreement was basically already tabled, and then... Uh, Johnson kind of spoiled it. So um, I don't understand why neutrality didn't become the solution. And by now, my answer is because the neocons in NATO didn't want it. They wanted everything and nothing less. Do you agree with that assessment or am I wrong? No, I think you're right. Um, and I think you can see this play out. Um, the Russian massing of troops on the Ukrainian border uh, came in the context of a demand for a negotiation on the European security architecture and reassurances to Moscow that weaponry would not be placed in Ukraine on its border. Um, uh, and it's clear that if Ukraine were to have been brought into NATO, such weaponry would have been placed. In fact, uh, Ukraine for eight years had been trained, reorganized, re-equipped uh, to NATO standards by uh, the United States and other countries, and this was a concern to Russia. The response of the United States was to a blunt refusal to entertain any discussion of European security architecture. Um, this meant that there was no path that negotiations, uh, a, a no negotiated path for the Russians to achieve what they regarded as a fundamental national security goal, and that is freedom from a uh, hostile presence on their border. Now, they agreed, of course, to the incorporation of the Baltic states into NATO. Um, they didn't like it, but they acquiesced. I don't think they saw Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania in any respect as, as threats to Russia. They expected that these small countries would be appropriately cautious in their dealings with Russia as as Finland had been um, for decades. Um, they agreed also to the Minsk Accords, which kept the Donbass and Luhansk regions as part of Ukraine uh, with a measure of autonomy. And so they weren't looking initially to detach these areas from Ukraine. The main issue was, in fact, Ukraine's alignment with NATO or its uh, incorporation into an American sphere of influence in Europe called NATO. Uh, the Russians were not proposing to embrace Ukraine as part of their sphere of influence. They were precisely asking for its neutralization. And um, the fact that this was rejected uh, was the product of a combination of triumphalism um, you know, uh, knee-jerk Russophobia um, and um, a desire to uh, put Russia down. Uh, and we saw that almost immediately after Putin responded to the rejection of negotiations by uh, using force against Ukraine. Uh, when um, when the um, uh, Sorry, I've lost the train of thought now. Um, so when, I mean, we we saw we we saw the 
um, the absence of in any interest in a diplomatic solution or a negotiated solution. Um, in the uh, statement by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, that the objective, our objective was the weakening and isolation of Russia. It was not saving Ukraine. And in fact, Ukraine has been severely damaged by this. It is not going to get into NATO. It is not going to retain its territorial integrity, which it could have had under the Minsk Accords. Um, it is not going to perhaps have a Black Sea coast at the end of this. It may not have a peace. It has lost about a fourth to one third of its population uh, who have fled the country. Um, it has been ravaged with much of its infrastructure damaged by Russian attacks, although the Russians have not done everything they could have done in that regard. Um, they have actually been somewhat restrained. Uh, I think it, they're looking to a peace beyond the war. Uh, but uh, Ukraine is going to come out of this most likely in a far worse condition than it would have been if it had accepted neutrality. The, the irony of this whole thing is that if actually Ukra the war ends and Ukraine will still not become a member of NATO, uh, as now NATO said, because they actually, that's the one thing they don't want. NATO doesn't actually want a direct confrontation with Russia. That's the one thing that's good about this situation. At least they don't want the Third World War. They wanted to play it out in Ukraine. But the, the tragedy is that de facto, Ukraine will be neutralized, de facto. Uh, of, course. And it... of course, of course, all this will turn out to have been really for nothing. And I would say that uh, what is, there's a very interesting element to this. And that is that um, uh, there has been an information war of formidable character. Uh, apparently, some people in the West believe that if you can win the information war, you win the war on the ground. Uh, but what we're now seeing is that is not the case. And in fact, the information war, which was designed to isolate Russia and, con and condemn it internationally, succeeded only in a limited part of the world. It did not incorporate the global South, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, or uh, certainly not China or India, um, um, Southeast Asia. Uh, most of the world looks at this as a quarrel among Europeans uh, rather than as something of global significance. Um, and uh, therefore, the framing of the information war that uh, the United States and NATO members undertook has not succeeded. Um, Ukraine has not been saved from damage. Russia was not deterred from attacking Ukraine. Uh, there has been no uh, clear war termination strategy. Uh, Russia has not fallen apart. There has not been regime change in Moscow as some expected might happen, and so forth and so on. So from the point of view of the West, in the end, when all this is over, uh, you can the one thing that has happened that has been arguably positive has been a measure of, of revitalization of NATO uh, as an institution and uh, better ties among NATO members. But I don't expect that to outlast the war. Uh, because you can already see the splits uh, between, let's say, uh, Hungary and Poland and Italy and um, your own country, Switzerland, got dragged into this in a way that has compromised Swiss neutrality that I suspect the Swiss will regret and um, not take as a precedent. We have one good piece of information, which is that we are now, right now preparing a referendum on, on strengthening neutrality again, which will come through in about one and a half years from now. And I do expect that this will push back the entire the entire situation quite a bit. 
uh, because there is no appetite in the Swiss uh, in the Swiss population for for actually taking sides. The question is: Is our sanctions taking sides or not? But let me ask you one more thing, because well, the answer to that is yes, they are economic warfare. They are, uh, yes, and, yes, and, they are. You know, and uh, so um, I don't know how the, the Swiss people who have, make up their own mind about things sometimes make decisions that seem rather odd to other people. Uh, about gender issues and so forth. Uh, but um, uh, I'm sure the Swiss will come to their own conclusion. I doubt that it will embrace sanctions uh, in future but for this I reason. I hope I so mean, too. And we've... Swiss, Switzerland, I have a very good Swiss friend um, who has always described uh, the Swiss as a hill tribe that knows something about money. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and uh, um, you know, and I think uh, Switzerland has prospered because it does know something about money and it knows something about not getting involved in other people's fights. Look, not being not being in war for 200 years is very good business. So that's the main reason why people should be neutral, because it's very good for business. So do business and stay out of other people's conflicts. It's quite simple. Well, you are you are Swiss, I can tell. <laughs> um, let me ask you one more thing, because you were there in the 1970s, you have seen how the Cold War could go from the height of, um, you know, the Cuba Missile Crisis, from the height of danger to relaxation. And 1975, the creation of the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe, to me, is the beginning of the end of the Cold War. It was this moment when all the Europeans get together in a conference, which they always have to do. 1815, big conference. Uh, 1918, big conference, 1945, a big conference, uh, 1975, a big conference. Conferences are always the moment of relaxation. Do you see any moment or any possibility for the Europeans and, and the Americans in the same boat to actually go back to talking? And when that happens, do you think the Russians will trust them? Because one of the main problems is that the Russians have been lied to time and again. And, you know, even the corn grain, the, the corn deal, the Russians have been cheated out of their part of the of the agreement. Do you exactly. think the Russians will come back to trusting the Europeans? I don't think the Russians will trust anybody in future. And I think one of the results of the recent evolutions uh, has been um, that um, Russia, which had spent 300 years trying to identify itself as European, develop a European identity has gone back to asserting itself as a separate civilization mm -hmm. and has turned east and south. It now looks to China and India, not to Europe. Um, that is a big difference. And the same, in some respects, has happened to Turkey, which also sought to Europeanize itself, uh, which the European Union EU accession process was very effective in changing Turkey for the better, uh, but it has almost given up. Now, I gather that uh, Mr. Erdogan, when he agreed to relent on Swedish membership in NATO, uh, extracted some sort of promise about a renewed path to EU membership. Uh, but I don't think your neighbors, the French, who seem to have some notion of Christendom and uh, and, a, and a dislike for uh, Islam, uh, which is tearing France apart at the moment, um, I don't think they are prepared to accept uh, a large Muslim member of the EU. And perhaps others in the EU feel the same. Uh, so um, I think... Um, what has happened is that uh, the the uh, Eurasian part of Europe, the part that um, connects to the rest of the Eurasian landmass, um, has spun off, and I don't think it's coming back. Um, now, having said that, um, NATO originally, the Partnership for Peace, was a potential concert of Europe mechanism, a European security mechanism that would have been universal in membership, 
which had a relationship with Russia through the um, NATO Russian Council, um, and which could have been taken on the management role of European security affairs that the uh, CSCE has not been able to take on. Um, so there are institutions that could be repurposed. Um, but I think uh, Russia will be very standoffish in the future for the reasons that you mentioned. 